Right. Well, it's great to see you all here. Thank you for coming. Um, my name's uh, Ed Wright or Edward Wright. I, uh, I work for Vortexa. Just a little bit about me and then we'll talk about what Vortexa does and get into the, the meat of it all. So I've been doing software longer than I can remember. Uh, so it's going a bit gray here. Um, I started probably at college learning C++ because back then they hadn't invented Java yet. Um, which I was quite happy about because I got into some quite low level coding and understand how the machine works and memory mapping and all, all these good things, a bit twiddling, which my colleagues will recognize in me. Uh, Java came along and I had a long glorious history of doing various projects in different investment banks, moving data around, low, some of it low latency, some of it not. So it's quite interesting, but then I, then I got into energy, worked for an energy company and then joined Vortexa as a startup seeing this company grow from, uh, for a tiny little baby of two people to, to, uh, to the company that it is today, about 125. Um, so yeah, C plus initially, then Java and now, and now Rust. Let's see where this is going. So what is Vortexa? Vortexa, I would say is not a software company. Uh, software is a means for the end. So we, we are using it as a tool. It is not really what we sell. What we sell is information. We're working in the energy market and we're actually um, taking information from uh, hundreds of different data sources, uh, some of it at quite high frequency, uh, aggregating this over time, slicing it in probably just on this screen about 30 different ways. We have lots of advanced filters that you can use. And uh, it's used in the energy market for trading. So people actually look to see for very specific products in different areas of the world what are the imports? What are the exports? What are the trends? What's happened over the last year, two years? Something happened in the news. How is that impacting things? Are vessels being diverted, which is infecting the future flows and the imports and exports that are happening in the future? So uh, we, we take in the data, we aggregate it, we slice and dice it, and we, we produce uh, information for our clients. Uh, so this is just one of the many screens on our platform showing uh, flow, flows of different products. This is another screen, just, just, just an example of what we're doing. It's, it's showing, we call it the map screen originally. Uh, it's showing uh, this total, we're probably tracking over 14,000 vessels around the planet. On each one of these, you can click on them, you can see what they're carrying, what product they're carrying. There's hundreds of different products, which we need to infer. Some of this is coming from hard data. Some of this is coming from machine learning models. And people can see what, what's going on and uh, dig into the information however they wish. The, um, the funny colors you can see there was just a weather overlay. So people can actually see the impact of weather as well on, on, on our map. There are different overlays for different kinds of information. So we have historically to date about 380 billion data points. We're receiving about um, 5,000 new data points every second. So it's pretty high frequency. We have hard data from many different data sources, such as port, port agents, people around the world giving us hard information on how much a, a vessel is carrying, what product it's carrying. That data is incomplete. So we are trying to pro produce a complete picture from incomplete, uh, incomplete data. Uh, so a lot of it needs to be inferred with machine learning models. Uh, I'm not going to lie and say Rust is some beautiful, uh, sorry, Vortex is some beautiful Rust utopia and we do everything in Rust and we're just a Rust shop. It's not true. We use lots of different technologies, but Rust is part of that equation. I would say we, we've got about 120, 130, no, 125 counting employees, project 130. We've just passed Series C investment, which is giving us a busy injection, investing into, into our future and developing new aspects of our product. Uh, we have a roadmap. It's not something I can talk about, but uh, exciting things coming up. There's always engineering to be done, or lots of engineering. I'd say we, 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 we do streaming data processing where our latency is measured in seconds, so we're getting data from, from vessels and within seconds this information is on our screens. Uh, and there's also what we call batch processing, which is using a, a batch framework called Airflow, where we have lots of tasks doing lots of processing because um, as anyone who's doing machine learning here probably knows doing inference in a streaming manner, it's feasible, but it's not simple. And it doesn't play well with how data scientists often operate. Uh, we provide an API as well as a UI to our users, so people can access us through a web browser, but they can also access our data programmatically. So we get tightly integrated into our customers. 
And uh, yes, we're used by energy customers, finance customers, and government. So how do we start with Rust? And the answer is by accident. Uh, it wasn't planned. Uh, I can't actually say, I know, I know there was a discussion earlier about uh, talking to, to management in your company if you're at that stage and saying, you know, is this a technology choice that we should choose? Uh, I don't think that conversation even happened. I think we just had a, we had a developer who said, you know, I'm going to do this. And um, it happened by accident because uh, he was writing a uh, piece of software to actually work out the path of vessels traveling around the world. Uh, he wrote it in Scala. He was a, a data scientist, this gentleman. He wrote it in Scala. Um, I'm not going to mention the name, so I can say it was done badly. It was done badly. Uh, the code was horribly slow. So he thought, because he was interested in new different technologies, he'd give Rust a, a, a try, because it does have a reputation for many things, but one of them is performance. So he ported that to Rust, and I would say he didn't do it in a... Um, when I'm thinking Python, we say Pythonic. What do we say? We don't say Rustonic, do we? Rustic. Yeah, it wasn't very rustic at all. Um, unless you call it rustic like uh, countryfied. But anyway, uh, there was, it wasn't really respecting the rules of Rust. It was trying to do data structures like you would do in another language, which is probably a, a lot of, um, a, a quite a common problem that developers coming from other languages will face. They, they try to use the new tool in the same way they use the old tool, and it's not always the right way to go about it. And so there was a lot of unsafe code. There was a lot of pointers going all over the place. Um, and despite all this, it was still terribly slow. Um, he then left, not for that reason. Um, but uh, this project has then been since developed. I took it on board and we got it down from using, I haven't really explained what it does yet, but it got it down from using, it was using about 240 gigs of memory and 70 cores, and now it's using less than two gigs of memory and uh, you can run it on. You can actually, I actually have run it on a Raspberry Pi for fun. Um, so we downscaled it somewhat. This project is called Pathfinder. And as the name suggests, uh, it's actually working out the, uh, the path vessels take when traveling across, across the oceans. So I have an example again from our platform. This, this screen is called Voyage Calculator. And it's just, it's a simple UI with a map and it's, it's actually calling this, this Pathfinder service behind the scenes. And uh, essentially you have a model. Uh, it's, a, it's a graph of over a million points with about 40 million connections linking uh, basically all the oceans and rivers of the world. And uh, you just give it a starting point and an ending point and it will find you the best route between them. There are subtleties such as avoiding coastlines, the subtleties that certain sizes of vessel can't go in certain places. You would not expect a, a giant vessel to go up a river, for example. So there are some constraints in this model, but that's essentially what it's doing. Uh, this is just an example of the model zoomed in actually, just a small, a very small area around, around Rotterdam in the Netherlands, just to see the actual complexity of the model. So you, you, you see all these interconnected nodes each node is on average connected to 40 other nodes. Now that's the average. There are some nodes which have hundreds of connections. So it's a, it's a, it's a quite complex model. But because of this, this will actually give you more accurate routes and the routes will look sort of curved and follow great circles and actually re, uh, correspond to reality a bit better. So let's start with the wrong solution, the one that was done in, in Scala and essentially the one that was done in Rust as well. So we, ha we have a request coming in uh, we have this model with uh, over a million coordinates in it with all these interconnections. What we don't have is a model that contains your starting point and your ending point. So the chances of those coordinates, some of them might be coming from a vessel, so there'll be GPS coordinates, a signal that you received. The chance of those coordinates actually being in your model, it's not nil, but it's nearly nil. But you need a model that does include those points because you're trying to create a pass includes the entire path from where the vessel actually is, not near where the vessel is, but actually where the vessel is. So what was done, um, and uh, I'm sure everyone who starts getting into Rust, one of the first hammers, one of the first tools you grab hold of is clone, to just, just clone things. They clone the model so they could then modify the model. That, that was expensive. That was like six seconds expensive. Now, if you're, if you're doing a, a web service, and this is, so if you'd have got a web service which is backing an interactive use within a UI, for example, I'm sure all the web developers in the room, when I say six seconds later, they're going to scream in horror. This is, this is just not good. This is not good at all. It did work, 
but uh, this wasn't uh, the way to do it. So once the model, five model was cloned, we could run our A star algorithm. The algorithm is actually called A star and we get results. That's the wrong way to do it. What's the right way to do it? Uh, and the interesting thing about this is it's not really a story about Rust. We're using Rust technology, but this is just, this is just software engineering. And it, I'm, I'm going to come to that point soon. So now we, we got a, re a request coming in and we actually have a, an immutable model. And because it's immutable, we can happily share it within threads. So our service suddenly becomes much more scalable. And we create a really thin layer on top of the overrides, which is just, this is the part of the model that's been modified by your request. So you may have a million nodes with all those interconnections in the immutable model, and you may have two dozen nodes in the, in the override. So that can, that can be created in, uh, well, it's hard to measure. It's, 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 it's not even a millisecond. It's incredibly fast. Um, and this is using, of course, a lot less memory as well, because before we had lots of requests coming in and different threads, it was all running in parallel. Each one had its own entire model. So that's how the, the old service was getting north of 200 gigs of memory used. And now we don't, we don't have to do that. And we, we, we've got something much more scalable. This thing is running under two gigs and we get results. So the point being, why Rust? Why did, why did we get into Rust? It's no substitute for good software design. Uh, I think that's the message. I'd say there isn't, there isn't a silver bullet where we, we use some language, Java, Python, pick a language and that's bad, which will lose to Rust and it's good. You can make a mess in any language. So I just want to put the point out there that software engineering, there is no, uh, there's no uh, substitute for that. And each language does have its own best practices. So don't, uh, you, you must take those into account. Uh, Rust has been incredible, rely credible, incredibly reliable. Some of that I will put down to all the uh, rigorous checks that are put into the compiler. Um, I suppose the mantra I, I work with is, if it compiles, there's a good chance it's going to work. Um, if you, those of you who have used Rust are probably quite aware of how that feels. Um, we find that when we build things in Rust, they are, they are pretty easy to maintain. They just don't break. They don't break. Our requirements can change. We may need to modify them, but uh, it's, it's pretty reliable as well. And because, it's, because we're not bogged down with, with, with trying to find stupid threading bugs because we've got immutable data, because we've got a language which just allows you to do whatever you want, and completely make a mess of things. We're probably spending our time more focused on actually adding value for our customers and, and uh, ch changing things when the requirements change. Work that we should be doing rather than busy work. And it's opened up new possibilities for us as well. Things that we, we, we couldn't do before. What kind of possibilities? So one um, research project I'm working on at the moment is we have a machine learning model, which is predicting where vessels are going in the future. Um, that's actually quite key to what we're doing, because if you think you want to know, for example, if you put your trader hat on, what's the exports of, uh, I should say imports really, what's the imports of, of, of gasoline into France in, in two months time? What might that be? You need to look at where all the movements of energy moving around the planet are going predict which vessels are going to go to France in the time frame that you want. Are they carrying the right products as well? It's absolutely key be, to be able to predict where these things are going. I don't mean the path, I actually mean the destination. And um, one thing I'm working on is a model where if we could look at a, a ship anywhere in the oceans or on a river, anywhere in the world, and see which direction a vessel is sailing, it's, it's only, this is just one aspect of, of the model, just one feature. We can actually see, is it sailing towards uh, a port or is it moving away from a port? We have, we have thousands of ports. Um, so imagine you've got a vessel which is off the, south co uh, off the coast of Chile and it's heading south. Is this ve vessel heading towards Rotterdam? It's very far, but is it? It could be because there is a route going around South America and then crossing the Atlantic. It could be going to Rotterdam. Um, if it was in Chile and heading uh, west, it's probably not going to Rotterdam. So the direction actually matters, and it matters at distance as well. So I'm trying to create a model which has a huge combinational vari vari uh, variety. You've got all these different positions around the world, you've got thousands of ports, you've also got 
many, many different sizes of vessel as well. And some can go in certain places, like I say, because there's restrictions with rivers and canals, and some can't. So you're not going to get the same route for different vessels. So basically, from any point on the planet, I'm trying to work out for every port on the planet, and for every kind of vessel, which direction should you go? That's a lot of combinational factors. Um, initially, we're starting by looking at these uh, points from the previous models. We've got about a million starting points on the planet and using this A star algorithm. This is not a good algorithm for bulk searching. Um, and this was actually taking about eight hours of processing for a single port. We have thousands of ports. It was going to take months of processing unless you scaled it really wide on the cloud. So either a lot of time or a lot of money, one of the two. Um, and you'll get results and you might have a bug in your code. It might not be good. You might have to do it again. This is a terrible developer iteration experience. Uh, change the algorithm. This is coming back down to software engineering using the right tools. And um, you can get results drastically faster. Now for one port, using all the different combinations of vessels, we can calculate it for the entire planet, not in eight hours, but in 90 seconds. And uh, this is part of the Rust story because Rust allows us to uh, use threads efficiently and saturate a machine really, really easily without a lot of the pitfalls that other languages might have. Um, there's, 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 there's languages which just plain can't do that without multiprocessing, such as Python. There are languages like Java which allow you to do that, but then with multi-threading, you can really make a mess with your data structures if you're not careful. Yeah. You can do it well, but you just need to be so careful. So um, this is when people say multi-threading is hard. But for, for many classes of computation, you can just borrow the crate rayon and then um, of, of your input data, iterate in parallel over it, which is what I'm alluding to there on that la last line of code, where you just have a, a collection of, uh, of points or centroids and we can just iterate over those in parallel. That one line of code calling an algorithm will happily saturate a machine. And it doesn't matter if it's got two cores or 100 cores. So you can really uh, plow through a lot of processing quite simply. These are the results. So this is, this is uh, just showing calculations for one port in Indonesia. The headings are actually encoded into the, um, into the, uh, the colors. So if you imagine where Indonesia is, you can see in South America, there's a discontinuity because you're at the other side of the planet and is the best direction east or west? There comes a point where you would actually go the opposite way. The discontinuity that's south of Indonesia, that's more just the way the colors are rendered because uh, if you're going a little bit east or a little bit west, you know, uh, it's going to render it as a different color just because of the circular coordinates. But that whole map, which is over a million data points for a certain vessel class, was calculated in 450 milliseconds on, on using a single thread. So Rust is really, really powerful for getting results quickly iterating and actually producing a model which can improve our accuracy and improve our data quality. And like I was saying at the beginning, Vortex is a data company. We are actually uh, judged on the quality of our, our data. So let's talk about some integration with the languages. So correlating vessels at sea. Sometimes vessels do quite get quite intimate. They get quite close because they want to actually transfer cargoes at sea. You, you may have a port which uh, isn't very deep, the water isn't very deep, and a huge tanker cannot come into port. So you'll actually transfer some cargo at sea and then use a smaller vessel to actually bring it into port. We need to, we need to detect those. We have billions and billions of input signals and we have certain areas of the world which are interesting for doing this. So we have what we call polygons, shapes if you will, we're using pointing polygon math to work out which of all these signals going around the world are actually interesting for this algorithm. If we apply this algorithm across the planet, it's going to cost too much in computation. And also there's plenty of areas of the planet where this doesn't happen and we'll get both positives, we'll get lots of noise. So we need to filter it down. We're talking about a filter here, but the focus isn't so much on the actual model. Now, that, before I get into this fifth code, let me just stay on the last slide, actually. The, um, the problem is we were using, we were doing this filtering processing in Python. Uh, using, we tried different libraries and everything, 
And when we're actually training our model, we're actually going through all our historical data, billions of data points, and the processing was taking about 30 hours, which is a bit horrible for, uh, for, for, for developer iteration uh, and quite expensive to run. Um, and it was seen that like about 26 of those hours was in one method. Well, that's interesting. So let's optimize that one method. Now we're using a crate called PyO3, which allows Rust to integrate pretty cleanly with, with Python code. Uh, we are a data science shop. We have lots of data scientists. They like using a tool called Pandas. I do apologize. It's a, it's a little bit like productionizing Excel. Imagine Excel spreadsheet in, in source code. You're not far off. But we do have Pandas code. Sorry. Uh, and one thing you can do with Pandas is you can extract columns of your data using a, a, another Python library called NumPy. Num and uh, PyO3 allows Rust to, to grab this data from NumPy with, with zero copy, very efficient. But we're not going to use zero copy. We're going to copy data. I'm a bad software engineer. No, really, there's a good reason to do this. So you can see on the, this, this method here, we're passing in the data with, with uh, NumPy arrays. Now, Python has a thing called the global interpreter lock. I'm not going to teach you Python this evening, but basically, the data structures in Python can only be accessed by a single thread at any one time. They are not send, they are not sync. You can't pass them between threads. Um, so that's a bit of a pain. And we really want to really lever want to leverage Rust to the maximum. So what we actually do is we copy that data into a Rust data structure in a single thread, which isn't perfectly efficient, but let's continue. Then we, having made that copy, we can then use Rayon to actually do the pointing polygon math en masse across all those coordinates very, very fast. And then we can gather our results, unfortunately, in a single thread again and send those results back to, to, to Python. So we have a mini map, reduce, <laughs> mini map reduce thing going on here. Despite the fact that we've got those single threaded sections, this is vastly, vastly quicker. So we added about 400 lines of Rust code to this project. It's pretty small. Uh, that's including a custom implementation of pointing polygon. We're using some uh, cheats to actually make it more efficient. We're avoiding floating point, for example. Uh, it's about 400 lines of code. And uh, the 24 hours of processing of that one method, that filtering method was taking that take one. So the whole process is taking six hours instead of 30 hours, which is a, is a massive difference. It's no longer a hotspot. And we, but more importantly, because we work a lot with data scientists, the actual model code, the bulk of the code of this project remains intact. We didn't have to modify it. We made a surgical um, alteration. So I think this is one of the messages I want to deliver today is you can use Rust surgically to make a big difference. It doesn't have to be a rewrite everything. I'm sure there's lots of Java fans in the room. Do bear with me. So the next, um, the ne the next thing here will be um, again, working on our destination model, predicting where vessels are going. Again, this is a machine learning model, so we need to train it. So as well as doing inference on streaming data with reasonably low latency, we need to do uh, bulk work to uh, do the training. And this was even heavier than the last one. So we have signals coming in. We have some business logic that processes them. And that needs to call this Pathfinder service because it needs to work out how far away the predicted destination is. It's actually working for an, an estimated time of arrival. We want to know when the vessels arrive, not or just where. Uh, that's a web, that was packaged up as a web service going via an AWS load balancer. And so you can, this is simplified diagram, but you can see that they, the business logic is calling out of this web, backend web service, doing its thing and producing results. During training, this was taking um, multiple machines working in parallel about a week. And it was costing one inference run, one, one training run was costing about $1,100 in Amazon costs. Uh, also, you have developers and, and uh, data scientists twiddling their thumbs, going, when is this thing going to finish? Is it going to finish? Is, is one of these machines going to crash? Or, or, or did we even write the software correctly? And when we got the results, are they right? It's, it's a terrible iteration experience. So what we did was a same story to before. Let's integrate some Rust code in the hotspot. 
And this time we're, we're, we're taking that entire shortest path algorithm that we talked, to the, talked about at the beginning of the talk and patching, pa packaging it up as a Java library. So this is just a tiny bit of Java that I'm showing you here. And the interesting thing is probably the first line of code, which is just a, a that's like a, an, an I64 in, in, in Java speak. It's a 64-bit um, number. And we're, we're actually storing a raw pointer in Java, which is a bit radical. But basically, Rust is going to do it in the initialization uh, code, which we'll see in a second, create all these data structures and everything, and then we're going to create a, a, a boxed pointer to that, store that in Java as a number, and then every time we want to call Rust, we take that number, we pass it into Rust, Rust can actually cast that back into its data structures and use it. So this is how Rust keeps its, keeps its uh, context. So here you can see the initialized stuff, I'm not going to show you all the initialization code. It's not very interesting. But the last line of code in there, you can see we're actually boxing, using Arc to be multi-threading friendly, a point to our, to our data structures. And uh, we're using a, a crate called JNI. And JLong is just a, a, an alias to, to I64, like I was saying. Then the actual processing code. Now, please don't look at this slide too carefully, because you'll go blind. But basically, the, 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 the interesting line of code is the first one in the function, the let, the let state line. This is the only unsafe code in the whole, in the whole uh, library, and that's just basically casting back this raw pointer, this just 64-bit number, into our data structure so then we can do some work. The rest of it is Java reflection, lots of Java reflection. Every single class, every single type, we have to look up dynamically, and that, that code is, is, is quite painful to, to write, to be honest. Um, but basically, going back to this, this is our new model now. We're using it in process, so it's now a library. It's just a function call. Uh, what are we avoiding? We are avoiding a network transit. We are avoiding a load balancer. We are avoiding um, auto-scaling issues. When this thing starts, it immediately puts on massive compute load. When we were using the web services, they needed to be scaled up. When they were scaling up, each one of those needs to load a model. That takes some time. Because that takes some time, some web requests fail. Because that, those web requests fail, our code retries. That amplifies the load still further, causing more auto-scaling. So the, 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 the back pressure wasn't working well at all. And we have the serialization issues too. So we're having to serialize because, because, because we're using a network stream. Now we can actually just pass data structures directly between the two languages. And uh, yeah. When we do this, our inference got, went from uh, one week to, uh, I think, under 24 hours, using less resources, and it costs $80 now instead of 1100 so, so now we can iterate much, much faster. So, so in summary, uh, language integration is a thing. I think many companies are beginning to do their journey into Rust, would I say. It's not the probably not the starting point that they're in. Maybe you're looking at a Greenfield startup, you could start it Rust from scratch. But uh, there probably is prior art, there's probably existing code. Could be, could be Python, could be Java, could be something else. There's a lot of integration to be, on, to be done. And just use, these, use Rust as a tool to make a difference where it really can make a difference. And that will allow you to uh, develop your models, develop your features, bring things to market quicker, serve your customers, and make profit, which is what we're doing. Thank you. That was a very interesting talk. Um, you mentioned that you, you guys use pandas and you have some specific way of interacting with Rust on that. Um, have you considered polars? Because it backend is written in Rust and interfaces with Python. And if you, try, if you tried it, did you find any difficulties integrating your business logic? It's a, it's a good question. I think we have done a bit of um, research into polars. Um, we just, we actually have, we have a moving target. We have a large code base and a lot of projects and the, these, this research just needs to be balanced with, with the continuing torrent of demands, I would say, from the, from the product side of things for, for new features. But uh, it certainly could be a valid approach. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. I might have missed something, but I did not quite understand why uh, using Dijkstra's algorithm was faster than a star. Okay, so um, a star will actually give you the uh, the route from one starting point to one finishing point. So I want to know from a certain place on the Earth what is the best route to a few thousand ports. So I would need to call A star a few thousand times, um, which would is going to revisit the same parts of the, the map many, many times and do quite a lot of calculations. Then I multiply that in turn by the number of vessel types I've got as well, because we're, we're interacting with rivers and places where certain vessels can't go. If I go to Dijkstra, Dijkstra will actually scan the entire world, and basically I can go to an entire graph and just make a note of every time I come across one of my ports. So I just do one big calculation. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's a, it's a million times faster. It's not. You still do have to visit every single node in your in your world to, to do this, but it is much, much faster. I was actually shocked at the difference. And that was all for the Q&A now. There's going to be a panel later, so if you have some questions, write them down. Uh, but other than that, big show of hands for Edward. Great.